We're here at the Sheridan Silver Springs, having just uh, been discussing some of the open public hearing testimony with many of the other advocates, patients, scientists, and clinicians. It drew an amazing crowd in support of the approval for Atepresin. I think if it does get approval, it will be because of the scientists and the families that have come to testify. It's going to be an exciting part of the, the hearing, and I think it's going to be probably the most impactful. And they're passionate about it, and so I think their passion will come through. I think this is the largest gathering of the Duchenne muscular dystrophy community in the history of the world. Hi, my name is Mindy Cameron, and I'm here in Washington, D.C. to attend the FDA Advisory Committee on Atepleson. My feelings right now are hard to put into words. This is a community and a club that I really didn't want to join, but I'm very proud, proud of everybody today. So that is going in my mind right now and in my heart, um, that everyone's come together and we're all nervous. <laughs> the community response to this meeting has been tremendous. It's incredibly emotional to be here and to see kids that I've known since I was, well, I guess I've known them for 10 years now and I've seen them progress in this disease in a, in a very natural history type of way. And now they're all in wheelchairs and it's uh, very emotional to see them all. So this is a treatment that we're going to have approved so that all boys have the promise of reaching their dreams. Thank you. Thank you every single person who is here. Thank you every single person who cares about a child with Duchenne. We're not alone. There are people who have come before us and we are setting the stage for the people who will come after us. The physicians and scientists have took their time to come a second time <laughs> uh, and uh, spent a lot of time on the phone, reading documents, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big burden and we're really very grateful, so thank you. I'm here because it is so important that we get this first approval and the consequent, consequence of approvals. Uh, we have to get this ball rolling or the next generation of kids behind my son Christopher are going to have the same fate and it doesn't have to be that way. This drug has reasonable evidence of working. That's what these laws are in place for. We have shown that and it's it's going to be a great day. I have very high hopes for what's going to happen at the end of today. I'm extraordinarily impressed at the turnout for this committee meeting as I look out over the audience today. And I was particularly impressed as I walked in through the public spaces of all the patients with DMD who are here. Thank you for being here. There is without question a profound unmet medical need in DMD. We have no approved treatments for this disease. We are highly sensitive to the urgency needed for the development of an approved treatment for Duchenne. Uh, we feel positive. The data is strong. It's, again, it's still an atypical data package. So I think there's some substantial uh, arguments to make to the FDA, to the ADCOM, that indeed there is substantial evidence of efficacy, which we believe is true. The data are there, and I think we're ready. We at Sarepta fully recognize that what we are about to present to you is not a traditional data set. It must be understood that DMD is an enormously challenging disorder to study. Nevertheless, we believe we have done both important and groundbreaking work. We heard stories about boys doing well on Etepherson. They were small but meaningful things that they had never done prior to taking the drug, like opening bottles of water and bags of chips. Boys with Duchenne often struggle with these types of activities. Let me conclude our formal presentation with this. Sarepta stands ready to work with the entire DMD community, patients, caregivers, providers, and our colleagues at the FDA to continue our groundbreaking work and hasten the day when we can say with certainty, we have a cure. This meeting is more, is, it's, it's about more than a Teplerson, a lot more. It's about the beginning of the road to treatments for all the boys. And that's why so many people are here. And it's, this is, we need this first approval. My own son doesn't benefit from this drug. So my fear is that 
if this doesn't get approved, it even puts a longer timeline for us. Um, I feel like it's time that the FDA recognizes a new way to do trials and a new pathway for rare disease. I would have expected him to have more of a physical decline by this stage of his life, and I feel that he would be completely non-ambulatory if it weren't for this life-saving drug. I see other boys my age and younger that cannot do what I can do. I've been on drug 18 months. Normally boys decline over that time, and I'm not only not getting worse, I'm getting better. 36 prominent scientists and physician experts in addition provided the FDA with a letter clarifying issues raised. Quoting from that letter, we conclude that there is strong evidence of induced dystrophin production upon prolonged Teplerson exposure. I am still walking, swimming, playing with my friends and my dog, which people say I could not do at this age. We did not have one side effect while we have been on a Teplerson. As a physician, I want the option to prescribe a Teplerson. We cannot withhold a safe drug from even one boy who may benefit. During the course of my career, I've diagnosed and cared for 250 boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Despite optimal care, none of those boys walk beyond 12 years of age. This clearly differs from the Atepilacin 201-202 experience, where boys continue to walk for three to four years of treatment at ages greater than 12. Our decision rests firmly on scientific research. Two years more walking is life-changing for patients and families. Maybe at first, these boys on this study were influenced by what the briefing document describes as expectation bias, motivation and coaching. Maybe. But this is Duchenne we're talking about. And we want the panel to know that every parent motivates their child to keep walking. Every parent loses that fight. I'm also here as the father of Dylan, age 15, living with Duchenne. He lost his ability to walk at age 13 and a half. Most boys that I know socially, and Dylan in particular, are very resistant to this transition and fight hard to push it back as long as possible. On a Teplerson, Aiden went from collapsing two to five times per day to not collapsing anymore at all. So we all know that a large-scale, long-term, SIBO-controlled trial would give us some of the answers we're looking for here today. But here's the deal. We can't have one. It's not numerically possible, and according to FDA's own guidelines on pediatric clinical trials, it is not ethical. The world's leading experts are here today telling us that what they're seeing is unusual. Our boys are changing in front of our eyes. I am incredibly proud to be standing here saying the same thing I've been saying daily since day one at Teplerson Works. Only today, I'm happy to be surrounded and supported by sound dystrophin and clinical data, physician, researcher, and patient testimonies similar to my own. I want to impress upon the panel that a recommendation for approval is the only acceptable outcome of today's meeting. We are the lucky ones, the boys in orange. So many are still waiting. Let's do the right thing. Thank you very much. Congress instantiated in statute our accelerated approval regulations, and in doing so, urged FDA to apply accelerated approval more broadly, particularly in rare diseases. Finally, I would note that much of the effort in evaluating a drug development program goes into avoiding a specific mistake, that is, erroneously approving a drug that is not effective. There often is little consideration of another error, which is failing to approve a drug that actually works. I mean, the FDA had asked for comparison to multiple sets of data, all the data that might be available. And so there is no primary comparison to one historical group versus another historical group. So this is just the truth about historically controlled trials. There's not really going to be a, an answer in the numbers. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be possible normally to conclude that it was an effect of the drug and not other differences between the patients and the way the study was conducted. Anecdote and emotion do not change the data with which we are confronted, no matter the attendance. Whether we have 1,000 here or only one, the same data will be there to consider, and I know that each of you will render the same scientifically sound opinions and judgments to a full room, 
that you would to an empty one. To what extent are we to incorporate into this question the testimony of the families, the, the, the boys and their families? Uh, from my reading of the question, From my reading of the question, it would seem narrowly worded towards the actual statistical results. Well, we are um, instructed, as people said, to take the views of the patient community into account it's more on the, the benefit and the risk. Whether the study is persuasive enough, that has a lot to do with the study design and what was measured and all, size all the size of the treatment effect and all those things. But you heard testimony that might affect your views on the quality of the endpoints, on the importance of lack of blinding, and all kinds of stuff like that. Because when I look at this question, and I think of question, the first one we discussed, you're talking about two different, there's some overlap in subjects, but you're talking about two different groups, particularly with the controls. I would have two different answers to the questions. One would be objective, one would be subjective. and. It's how to reconcile both in the same question here, that I guess is the issue, um, but... The question sp twice mentions well controlled, and as you've heard repeatedly, people have said that they had trouble with the control. So this well controlled phrase, in a sense, tips or constrains the question. Let's I understand a lot of people don't like historically controlled trials. They're not sure they believe they're well controlled. Our regulations since 1970 have said that a historical controlled trial can be a well controlled study, an adequate and well controlled study. Okay, so we'll move to voting then and I'll read the question. If you voted once, please uh, do so again. And the question is as follows. Do the clinical results of the single historically controlled study, study 201-202, provide substantial evidence, that is, evidence from adequate and well-controlled studies, or evidence from a single, highly persuasive, adequate and well-controlled study that is accompanied by independent findings that substantiate efficacy, that ediparsin is effective for the treatment of DMD. Everyone has voted, the vote is now complete. We have. Three yes, seven no, three abstentions. Now I also abstained because I, I'm uncomfortable by the language of the question because I think it's a bit leading. I don't believe that an external control is customary in a study like this um, at all. And so I can't say I'm in favor of that, but I'm very fearful that we'll leave here with some sort of stalemate between the FDA and the, and the panel where I'm, I'm still quite sympathetic to the uh, and persuaded by the, uh, by the public's uh, um, presentations. I'm not as uncomfortable to just say no. I think there's still room to work here. I voted yes. Um, as a pediatric neuromuscular specialist, for me, there's substantial evidence that there's amelioration of the clinical phenotype of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, I believe there's more data is needed. Uh, you know, confused a little bit by um, the fact that, that there did appear to be evidence from the audience um, from more patients that were than, that were presented here from some of these newer studies and some of these extension studies. And so I think, um, you know, I think that there is still um, information to learn about this, uh, about this drug, but. And unfortunately, um, the, what I would consider meaningful evidence or testimony from the families is not properly measured in the study. I voted no. Uh, the placebo portion of the study didn't, um wasn't positive on the primary outcome measures, and I had issues with the historical control for the secondary clinical endpoints. If I had to vote based on the testimony I heard, if this was a before and after um, question, definitely, based on all that I heard, the drug definitely works, but the question was framed differently. The emotion and passion in the room uh, during the discussion is, is, is clear. And I mentioned at the beginning of the day uh, that we listen and we listen carefully. And although I recognize there's great concern about the discussion and the uh, results of the votes, I assure you that we've listened very carefully. We've heard some very meaningful testimony today and we've observed the panel uh, be highly influenced uh, by that testimony. Uh, I assure you that we will uh, uh, take, take the information we've learned here today 
under very serious consideration uh, as, we, as we adjourn this meeting. The number of questions around the questions I think was instructive of the fact that they were just poorly designed questions, poorly structured, and there was so much ambiguity in them. Right now I'm just, I can't breathe. <laughs> I can't stand to hear any more about large placebo control trials. And it's been four years and I'm working with Sarapta and getting guidance, and I don't know why they keep going back to that. I think it's got ramifications. I don't know what the outcome's going to be, but it's got ramifications which are much wider than this. You know, I mean, it's pretty off-putting for pharma. It's pretty off-putting for you know anybody that's thinking about entering this arena and developing a drug. It's been a really hard day, but in the community, you guys all pulled together. You spoke very Maybe they're afraid that this would be precedent setting and other companies would come in and try and do the same sort of trial. But if we're going to rehash history, no one in their right mind would do something that they keep thinking is going to work in a year and get feedback that they're only going to have to do it for a little while. And then, I mean, this isn't accelerated approval. This isn't priority, you know, review. All these laws have been put in place to make it faster an advantage for the rare disease community. Yet, when you go to negotiate the real thing, it's a slower process because they don't know how to do it. From what was observed yesterday, the process is broken. This is not a valid way to review mm -hmm. a rare disease drug. There's just no question about that it's just whatsoever. It's not modern on any level. Yeah, absolutely. They need to modernize this. They seem more focused on the structure of process. the process than the reality of what the Seriously. drug does. Yeah. I think if the leadership looks at all the data, looks at the performance of the FDA, looks at the performance of the outcome, looks at the totality of the data, the leadership ought not to be able to do anything else other than to sign off on accelerated approval of the drug. I mean, really, honestly, that's the answer. Unless the FDA starts approving drugs based on different kinds of measures than what a traditional drug approval is, then we're not going to get anywhere. And we have a whole other generation of boys like my son. I can see both sides. I understand that that they don't. The FDA is protecting us from, you know, snake oil salesmen and money being made off of something that doesn't work. And I kind of understand why it's all there, but it still doesn't help because you still feel alone. And when your kid has something, and none of those resources help, it's hard. I feel like four and a half years isn't accelerated at all, honestly. And I, I think it's funny that it's an accelerated approval. We have to teach the FDA how to do non-placebo controlled trials um, as we all, for every disease, work towards personalized medicine. So I feel like we're educating them in a way and we're part of something and it's time. So I am proud of that and that's why I'm here.